Good day, welcome to justlovingpeople.com. My name is Lawrence and Michelle. Yes, and we're talking to you from South Korea, Seoul, from the lobby of the hotel where we slept last night because we had to run for cover. Yes, because it started pouring outside. It's, it's not a light drizzle anymore, it's pouring. It's pouring rain outside. And the thing that fascinates me, this music that you can hear in the background, is a white grand piano playing all by itself. Yes. Have you seen something like this? Only smaller ones, and I've seen plenty in movies, but not in real life, so it's quite a treat. Yeah, it's my very first time to see that, and yeah, it's awesome. So today I'm going to tell my story, how I ended up in South yes, Korea. Please. And it is an amazing story that started more than 20 years ago. You know, um, when I was 20 years old, I'm almost 40 now, um, I had a prophetic word where this lady told me, you will be a missionary or more like you will have a ministry in another country. I always thought it was America, you know, <laughs> so I always was, you know, had this dream of going to, to America, but um, it never worked out. And then I went to Bible school for seven years. I always loved the Lord. I started my own um, kind of business. That failed. And I ended up next to a dam on the farm where we rented a house with no money. You know, I had to move back in with my parents. And I was sitting next to this dam praying. And the next moment, an uh, airplane flew by, you know, a big Boeing 747. And I looked at it and said, God, I don't even have money to go to the airport. How will I ever have a ministry in another country? So, guess what? Two weeks later, I was on an airplane like that on my way to South Korea. And as I arrived here in South Korea, it was just my whole life and world changed. It literally two or, two or three weeks. Now, the reason why I came to South Korea in the first place was to be an English teacher. But of course, my heart and everything was missionary. So, um, as I arrived here, I realized nobody speaks English. <laughs> it's just Korean. So, somebody met me at the airport. He was late. So, imagine arriving at an airport and you don't know where's the guy with your name on. Well, he came. He put me on a bus and off I went. And for four hours I was driving through tunnel after tunnel and it was pitch black and I was, where do I get off? Nobody speaks a word of English. But then the bus stopped in the middle of nowhere. The bus driver looked at me and said something and I just knew that means get off in the middle of nowhere. Anyways, I got off and then I heard these lovely words. Welcome to Korea. Now that was my boss, her husband and their children. Now the next part, the next scene happened in five minutes, literally five minutes. They grabbed my bags, we run, ran to a yellow bus um, and this yellow bus drove me to a um, three-story apartment building, Is you know these uh, one rooms. And we ran up the stairs, they gave me a hamburger, chips and coke. They closed the door and said, see you tomorrow. And, yet, and that was, what? As I opened the window, I saw trash. You know, well, it happened to be just in front of a trash heap. And it looked so dodgy. <laughs> I was just scared. I was just like, God, I'm going back tomorrow. There's no way I'm staying in South Korea. Anyways. That next morning they picked me up for lunch with the yellow bus and we ate this um, kimchi. I ate kimchi for the first time. It's really spicy cabbage, uh, traditional food that we eat here in South Korea. I remember the, the, the soup came in bread and pork cutlet and rice and so that was my very first lunch. And then she said, let me show you the school. I'm like, okay. So as we arrived at the school we were full of Korean kids that I've never seen in my life, she opened the door, pushed me in and said, this is your class. <laughs> so, no training, no experience in teaching. I was looking at, you know, these Korean eyes, you know, these um, cute kids, eight of them staring back at me. I stared at them and I looked at the book and this is how I started teaching. Now I 
So I arrived in Korea after nine months. Um, you know, I've, I've been looking for a church, but no English church in the... I ended up in the mountains, this tiny little city called Sangju. So one day I just had this fire burning in me. Well, not one day, it was in me all the time. I'm a missionary, I need to do something. So I took a big step of faith. I rented the biggest, well, the only stadium in that city. I booked all the front page newspaper ads. And I started to um, arrange this conference. I wanted the Korean churches in that city to come together in a big event and pray for the city, like a day of prayer thing. So now I had this translator that I met, and she was a Buddhist lady. And she translated all the meetings. So soon I found myself meeting with pastors, having lunch. And guess what? They all said no. They were not ready for this foreigner out of nowhere trying to How do it. did you feel then? I feel discouraged. Man, I felt so discouraged and it ending up in me cancelling the whole event, you know. And it was so cool. My translator said, I'm praying for you. I'm praying yeah. for you. <laughs> that was so cute. Anyways, I felt terrible. I really felt I've let the Lord down. I'm, you know, I've been here nine months. I, you know, I didn't do anything good, you know, uh, ministry-wise, but anyways, in your eyes. On, yes, on that day and time, and that very same day, I was invited to this little church in the mountains, where this lady preacher will give me some prophetic word, that is what the pastor said to invited me, I was, prophetic word, I don't want to hear anything, she's just going to tell me, you must do God's work, and I just failed miserably, you know, so, but off we went, we drove into this, into the mountains again, and as I stepped into that church, man, I felt the Holy Spirit, I was so happy, That's the first the time, feeling. that is awesome, you know, all these Koreans were sitting on the floor, because in Korea they don't have chairs, well, now, you know, nowadays the churches have chairs, but there in the mountains, it's traditional stuff. But I felt the Holy Spirit, and, that, and the translator, um, he came to me, a guy, and he just started to translate, and everything I followed, you know, the whole sermon. And in the end, he said, uh, she wants you to pray, close in prayer. I'm like, me? And then the whole, you know, everybody looked around, and I knew, okay, he's not lying. So I went to the front, and I was wondering, what will I say? And as I opened my mouth, I couldn't talk. I just cried because I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit it came like a cloud. And I just said, welcome Holy Spirit, that's all I could say. So the next moment he came and the Koreans were crying, they were being healed, set free for one hour. We all just witnessed the Lord in action. And that was so even surprising to me. And then this lady said, wow, that was awesome. We don't know about healing. We have another service Sunday morning in our other church. Can you also come and pray there? <laughs> so, off and I went. went. Yeah, um, it was snowing. It was they picked me up with this black car, and off we went into the mountains again. Around about 4 p.m. after everything finished, the morning service, the lunch, the you know the after lunch service, it was time for me to go to the front and pray. And I just thought to myself, God, if you want to show up again please do that. I'm just going to welcome you and you know like that. And when I say these words, welcome Holy Spirit, I saw a flash at the right door and I believe it's the first time and the only time that I've seen the Lord and the same thing happened and many people got healed and it was nobody prayed, nobody touched with them, they were just healed by, by, by God's presence. As we drove off, the, the, that lady pastor said, wow, God healed my stomach today. Wow, that's awesome. I, you know, I don't, I don't know what God did, you know. If, if you um, meet someone that's in the same position that you were nine years ago when you came in South Korea, what advice would you give them if they feel the way you did then? Just giving up, what advice would you give them? Don't give up. <laughs> that's that, that's that is that simple. Yeah, I felt like giving up, and and I, I just kept to the Lord. You know, like He said to the disciples, 
do you want to go? And they said, but where? Where? Where will we go? We don't have anything else but you. I've said that many times. I felt like giving up many times. And every time I just realized, where else will I go? So after that experience, they asked me to become one of the pastors. So this is how I changed from a teacher to a pastor here in South Korea. And then I stayed on the top of this roof, uh, the, the church roof. There was a one room, I think, for two or three years. And yeah, that's the one thing that amazes me from our country where we stay. How productive people are with everything. You know, it is not just single-mindedness. You know, everything is how can we utilize every single centimeter of a space yes. into something like on top of the the one room apartment on top of the church you know there was extra space so they made it an apartment that's they, yeah. beautiful yes so there I stayed and then my parents wanted to join me so now I needed a house and just a few days after that I got this Korean mud house that I stayed in for three or four years but now we had the house, but no furniture. And um, anyways, the next day, my friend called me and said, I'm moving back to Canada. I'm taking my bags of clothes. You can have all my furniture. He literally gave everything to me. You know, he just took his clothes. So I had to hire a truck. We were moving wow. in. Boxes and boxes of stuff we were unpacking, you know, the smallest detail that you cannot buy, you know, in just one just one month yes. or it would take a long time. And after that people just started dumping stuff in front of my house like um, sofas and beds and things, you know, there were this trash and as I talked about the trash in the beginning. I never realized that from the trash, yes. God will provide my furniture. Yeah, it's like Joe. <laughs> <It's like Job. laughs> yeah, so oh, it is amazing. I think the message that I want to give is if, if God says something, you know, but he will what provide. happened after your mud house? Well, after the mud house, I actually lost we my mud house. We still have like two minutes left, yeah. so you can so squeeze that I, in I, for us. I actually lost everything. You know, it just went down. I didn't understand it, but God, God had a plan. Because I went back to South Africa again with nothing for a vacation. So then you I arrived you. with nothing and you left with nothing. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that, that's full circle, right? Yeah. And so as I went back to South Africa, um, just um, ending up on my sister's <laughs> uh, floor again. You know, um, I never knew that God was about to give me a wife, that is you. And, well, we're going to need a, a whole week just to explain how God <laughs> provided the second time. Because we came back with just our clothes. Yes. And here we are in South Korea with Lacking nothing. a beautiful apartment. The furniture came again. Again, it came. The clothes came and everything we needed. Well... Yes. It was my story, and tomorrow we're going to talk about your story. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, from me, Lawrence, here at IslamicPeople.com, please go to the website and you can download all these episodes for a donation of any amount. Thank you for your support. You can also watch our latest movie called Just Loving People, because this is what we do. We just love people. Yes. As we talked this week about God's kingdom is love, and we Absolutely. need to show that. Yes, from me, Michelle, I would just like to say, God bless, love each other, remember Matthew 6 verse 33, seek me and my kingdom first and all else shall be added unto you. Amen. Goodbye. Goodbye.